Do you want to grow your career and have a bigger impact on the world? The Pepperdine Grazia Dio Business Schools programs are designed to develop you as a purpose-driven leader. With full and part-time offerings, in flexible formats and with specialized concentrations, you have the ability to customize your educational pathway to fit your unique needs. Whether you're just starting out, at a C-suite level, or somewhere in between, we have a program to transform your career and help you achieve your personal goals. To help you get there, we have many scholarship and financial aid opportunities available. Make the most of who you are, for yourself and for the world. Learn more about our programs and scholarship opportunities today. Welcome everyone to the 2021 Pepperdine Grazia Dio Business School's Most Fundable Company Showcase. Presented by the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship. I'm Dr. Craig Everett, Finance Professor and Executive Director of the Most Fundable Companies Competition, and your host on this exciting day as we unveil our fourth annual Most Fundable Companies list. We normally enjoy hosting all of you at our sunny Malibu campus. However, for the second year in a row, we are coming to you virtually. We hope to be back in person for next year's showcase. We have an amazing lineup for you this year, including a fabulous keynote discussion with Jamie Simonoff, founder and chief inventor of Ring. This keynote discussion will be led by Landon Phillips. And I'm certain that you're going to enjoy our other distinctive guests, beginning with those who have made both the competition and this event possible today. I'd like to personally welcome and express my genuine gratitude to Will and Carrie Singleton. The Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship is our title sponsor for this year's event. Carrie will join us later to highlight their impressive and impactful programs. We are deeply appreciative to the George and Riva Grazidio Foundation as our legacy sponsor. We are fortunate to have Louis Grazidio with us to share a special message. We also welcome Vince Montepart, who serves on the board of the Grazidio Business School with Louis and as co-chair of the Entrepreneurship and Family Business Committee. And our sponsors at the platinum level are TVA and Wealth Teams Alliance. We look forward to introducing you to Jim Kasperi and Dr. Guy Baker, who served tirelessly on our program's advisory council. I'd also like to thank Dean Derek Van Rensburg, the entire Grazia Dio board, and our most fundable company's advisory council members. They are Connie Harrell, Elliot Reef, Dr. John Paglia, Kim Whittemore, Ron Munman, Ryan Groves, Sylvia Ma, Stephen Price, and Amy Wood, who brilliantly manages this entire competition and event. And of course, we welcome the people most important to this event, the entrepreneur founders of our 2021 Most Fundable Companies. After months of learning about your companies, we are excited to announce you today for the first time. We have 16 winning companies presenting today. Remember, our purpose is to help our list winners get funded and we hope that many of you watching today will invest. Company presentations and additional company information will be available on our website after we conclude today. Additionally, the Most Fundable Companies list will be published in Entrepreneur Magazine's December issue, which hits newsstands and goes online on November 23rd. Now at this time, I have the distinct honor to introduce a man who ensures that the entrepreneurial heritage of the Graz Dio Business School endures. Through his vital support of the Pepperdine University Board, the Grazia Dio Board, and programs like the Most Fundable Companies. Please welcome our very own Louis Grazia Dio. Thank you, Craig, and uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the 2021 Pepperdine Grazia Dio Business School's Most Fundable Companies Showcase. I've been asked to share a few remarks with you about the legacy of my father, George Grazio Jr. A few minutes wouldn't do justice to my father's legacy, so I'll stick to talking a little bit about him being an entrepreneur. Part of my father's legacy would certainly be that he had an incredible memory. He could stand in a reception line and meet and greet a hundred or more people after the event or ceremony two or three hours later. He could recall those people by name and the places they were from. My father was a great public speaker. Uh, I'm not a public speaker, especially with a vocal cord disorder, so I apologize in advance uh, that you are having to listen to this uh, voice of mine. And I, I, 
I live with it every day, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I do love talking about my dad and the lessons he taught me and the experiences he shared uh, with me. I think it's interesting that more than 20 years ago, my father was still um, alive and we tried to launch a venture capital platform for entrepreneurs at the business school to showcase their businesses and raise capital for them. It got complicated and didn't happen for several reasons. Now with new leadership that has really impressed us and with the successful launch of the most fundable companies event, we are excited to support this. We see even greater potential and growth in this becoming a much larger premier annual event, bringing new ideas and businesses together with capital, especially with Silicon Beach right here at our doorsteps and with a lot of young entrepreneurs running around. My parents had a lot of great friends at Pepperdine going back about 60 years. They were very proud of being involved with Pepperdine in part for the for its Christian roots, its vision and mission. Our family remains committed and involved. My father grew up during the depression, very poor. Going to college was not an option for him, but he didn't let that hold him back. He started out in business doing many jobs to survive and make a living. As a result of uh, a lot of hard work and experiences, he became a successful entrepreneur involved in many businesses from real estate development to banking. He financed many kinds of companies, including technology and internet companies along the way. To be able to do that as successfully as he did, he had to be a successful entrepreneur himself. He would be most excited that the Grasdale Business School would be teaching many of the same things he learned in becoming a successful businessman and entrepreneur. We throw the word entrepreneur around quite a bit, but that, but what does it take to become an entrepreneur? What I learned from my father was it takes vision, creativity, and a willingness to innovate and take risks to have new ideas, to have a purpose, and to take the initiative to accomplish those new ideas and to overcome all those risks. But one, of the, but one thing that my father stressed a lot about being an entrepreneur was that no one could teach someone else to work hard, but if anyone, but if anyone could, it would be him. Teaching uh, that hard work, enthusiasm, putting in the hours, will most often make the difference between success and failure. I have heard it said that you can't always control the outcome, but what you can do is control the effort. So if hard work is an important key to success, then find something that you really love to do. If you do that, you will be blessed. And if you work hard enough, you are most likely to be lucky. So strive to be blessed and strive to be lucky. Don't second guess yourself. Make the best decisions you can with the data you have. Said another way, life and business are made up of a series of judgments on insufficient data. And if we waited to run down all of our doubts, the opportunities would be missed and life would pass us by. He loved to use short sayings to deliver powerful points. Here are a few of his favorites. A pessimist sees difficulty in every opportunity, while the optimist finds opportunity in every difficulty. If better is possible, then good is not enough. And real leaders are ordinary people with extraordinary determination. And for all of you that may be procrastinators or have a little procrastination blood in your, in your system, his favorite saying was TNT, today, not tomorrow. He didn't take kindly to procrastinators. My father always said, you never see statues of pessimists being erected, so be an optimist. He also liked to put humor into his speeches to make his points. Here's one. Two shoe, two shoe salespeople were dispatched to a remote African country. 
In just a few days, their employer received telegrams from each of them. One read, get me out of here, no one wears shoes. The other read, send more inventory, no one here owns shoes. So be optimistic. When my father was confronted with challenges, he would uncomplicate the matters on his yellow writing pad and a red flare tip pen and got busy uncomplicating things quickly. He loved humor, as I said, to make a point. A successful city slicker from the East Coast had always dreamed of owning his own cattle ranch and finally made enough money to buy himself the spread of his dreams in Wyoming. His best friend flew out to visit him. After being given a tour of the ranch, he asked his friend, so what have you named the ranch? We had a hell of a time, admitted the new cowboy. Couldn't agree on anything. We finally settled on the double R, lazy L, triple horseshoe, bar seven, lucky diamond ranch. Wow, his friend was impressed. So where are all the cows? Well, None of them survived the branding. So try to keep things simple. In closing, our family's grateful to James Gasperi and the Bitcher Alliance for their donation of the intellectual property to the most fundable companies and for their support in carrying out the program. We also want to acknowledge the Grazio Board of Directors and the most fundable companies advisory council. Lastly, I would like to personally thank the Singleton Foundation for their partnership in bringing us all here today to celebrate entrepreneurs across America and to also congratulate the Singletons in the legacy of their father, Henry Singleton, who was one of the most remarkable industrialists and serial entrepreneurs of the past hundred years. Thank you and God bless and please welcome Gary Singleton. Thank you, Lewis. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Singleton, and it is a pleasure to be here today and to bring the support of the Singleton Foundation for Financial Literacy and Entrepreneurship to the 2021 Most Fundable Company Showcase. Congratulations to all the list winners. Entrepreneurship is part of my family story, and it is certainly the story for these presenting startup founders. It is also deeply woven into our foundation's initiatives. My husband, Will Singleton, and I established the Singleton Foundation with a mission to harness the power of entertainment and storytelling to make financial competence a reality for everyone and to promote entrepreneurship to inspire individual achievement. And here's how we're doing that. We have a free entertainment channel, Million Stories Media, which distributes compelling financial and entrepreneurial content and free resources focused on millennial and Gen Zs across mobile, desktop, and social platforms. Million Stories launched last summer, and we have already reached over 100 million viewers. And we have an esports style game, Venture Valley, where you can play a fun and exciting game by starting a small business and growing your business empire. You can play with your friends, but there will also be national competition, where the best players have the opportunity to win amazing prizes like a scholarship for college. Now, if you're interested in seeing if your idea can become a reality, check out our free entrepreneur shop. This is a place where you can find the content, tools, and community to learn how to be an entrepreneur, or at least think like one. And finally, our annual CEO prize, which honors the legacy of Will's father, Henry Singleton, the founder of Teledyne. The prize honors a living CEO whose work has demonstrated a similar combination of talent, vision, focus, and commitment, and one who has produced exceptional returns for shareholders. Our goal is to help upcoming generations to learn how to think like entrepreneurs and become the CEOs of their lives. Perhaps even launching the future most fundable companies. Most products and services are a result of solving a problem, kind of like how the oyster turns an irritating grain of sand into a pearl. And I can think of no better example than how the ring camera came about. So I'm happy to bring you today's keynote conversation led by Landon Phillips, our Singleton Foundation's Head of Innovation, and our Oyster to Pearl Innovator needs very little introduction. Let's welcome inventor Jamie Simonoff. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jamie. We really uh, appreciate you coming out here. Thanks, thanks uh, for having me. Picking up from, from Carrie's introduction there, 
um, as as you know, many of the world's great oysters have come from you know that irritating grain of sand, that that one little problem. What was the problem? What was that grain of sand for you that led you to create the pearl that is the ring? Well, the way you said it, I mean, it's such a beautiful way to say something that's just sort of so uh, transactional, which is I was in my garage. I was trying to build other things. I had this thing called Snap Garden, a modular gardening system, which you would have set up on your patio. It looked like we were doing something definitely very sort of, I'll say, either illegal or different in my backyard at the time, trying to grow all this stuff on these little modular things. Uh, anyway, I digress. I couldn't hear the doorbell in my garage when I was trying to invent this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I went out and tried to get one of those wireless doorbells. It didn't work. And I, I just got an iPhone. And so I'm like looking at this iPhone. I'm like, why wouldn't the doorbell? So I looked for a Wi-Fi doorbell that would go to my phone. Nothing existed. So I just built one. When I say that, it, I, I, I didn't, it wasn't an aha moment. Mm. It wasn't like, oh, wow, I think I just invented the next X. It mm -hmm. was, I need this. Why don't I just build one for my house? So that's, that's interesting because a lot of people tend to think that they're, they're waiting for that lightning strike moment of clarity where it's yep. like, this is going to be it. But for you, it was just kind of like, this is an itch I need to scratch and we'll move on from there. It's like solving a problem, like any problem around your house, you mm -hmm. know, just, just, uh, and, and, and then it was my wife that when I sort of, I hacked up a camera and a button and made it so that like when it hit, it sort of surged the thing. And then that sent me an alert saying that, you know, it was basically saying it had an error, but I knew that was the doorbell going off. Mm -hmm. And so I, I kind of built this thing and my wife said, you, we lived right on the street, a little house in LA. And she said, wow, it feels like we have gates now, like this, this feeling of security. Uh -huh. And that was the start of the aha. But it was that was the first big seed, I'd say, where I remember it being like, I think this is something more than just uh, scratching my own itch. Mm. So having like somebody else kind of confirm that yeah. hey, this, this may have some, some legs to this idea. And also that it wasn't, I built it originally. I mean, the, the first thing was really just this gadget mm -hmm. to solve my problem. Mm -hmm. And so that to me was not an aha. It was just like fixing anything. Mm -hmm seeing that sort of that higher need, like that, what it was, the effect that it was having, not as a gadget, but as like this sort of feeling of protection. Mm -hmm. That was really the start of like the evolution of, I'll say, what the company became. Have you felt like you've always kind of had a knack for entrepreneurship or for that kind of problem solving? It's funny. So I, I thought I was an entrepreneur when I was like younger. I, I went to Babson, mm -hmm. uh, which is, yeah, has an entrepreneurship program. So I sort of like learned the word entrepreneurship and I came out and people said, oh, you're a serial entrepreneur. And what I realized pretty quickly is I wasn't an entrepreneur, I'm an inventor. Hmm. And to me, the difference is an entrepreneur is someone who's focused on building a business. Um, an inventor is someone who's focused on solving a problem. Hmm. The reason that I have a business is because in order to solve a problem and do it at scale and have it affect people, which is I think the satisfaction an inventor gets, is I had to have a business. So to me, the, the business is like the output or the thing I needed to have in order to have my invention mm -hmm. be, get in the hands of people, you know, but I really probably wouldn't really care about the business side as much as the invention side. So then as an inventor, you know, you're, you're faced with lots of prototypes. Version one doesn't work quite, yep. version two doesn't work quite right. Uh, and you're kind of iterating and working through the process. Do you notice a lot of parallels between that and entrepreneurship? How do you kind of get through the broken prototypes, as it were, when you're faced with entrepreneurial challenges. The difference between an inventor and entrepreneur is so sort of close. It's just, I think it's like, what's your end goal and mm -hmm. where are you coming from? No, nothing right or wrong, by the way. It's just, it's just, I think it's, once you know what drives you, I think that's actually what it's like, once you know that passion of what drives you, mm -hmm. that is a great way to lead to success. And so for me, what was driving me was seeing and fixing someone's problem, mm -hmm. not sort of building the business. I've seen other people that's more building a business is what's driving them. Right and doing that. But but to that point, I think it's it's very similar, like the paths on both um, of you have to iterate. Uh, you can't usually an invention, a, a true invention, you probably can't see that it's going to work mm -hmm. when you do it. I mean, it's it's that's the, the definition of invention is it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to invent something. Same thing with entrepreneurship. You're trying to build something that probably doesn't exist in that way or you're doing it differently. And so you can sort of can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I think both inventors and entrepreneurs need to have that sort of that hope which is what, you know, that passion will keep driving you until that light starts to sort of shimmer, at least, at the end of the tunnel. I don't know if I've seen the full light yet, but like, I, <laughs> I hear it's there. <laughs> I'm sure you're making great progress. Um, uh, we're working towards it. <laughs> so then as you're kind of working through, you know, obviously Ring is not your first rodeo. You've had several inventions, several ventures, several companies that have kind of come and gone um, before then. I'm really curious, because everybody kind of hopes that their, their pet project is going to be the one that yeah. is their version of ring or you know their their you know retirement goal or whatever 
whenever you have these other smaller projects that came before and it was time for you to decide, do I kind of close this chapter and move on? Do I look for a buyer? I feel like that's probably got a lot of mixed emotions in that sort of a decision. G going back to those kind of moments on your journey, what did that what did that feel like when you're trying to make those calls? What's well, so the the difference between everything up until Ring for me and Ring was as I started to get like you sort of started to see the 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 seeds of this is I sort of made this little gadget mm -hmm. fine. My wife sort of saw that it did something bigger and more interesting. And the aha moment for us and the real invention at Ring was our mission to make neighborhoods safer. Mm -hmm. And so that was what, the mission to make neighborhoods safer is what drove the business, what drove the company, what drove the product lineup, what drove the invention. It's like sort of drove everything. It also drove our decisions around, do you sell it? Do you try to, you know, do you, how, like how would you build this business? And mm -hmm. so when you have a mission as broad as making neighborhoods safer, that's not like, oh, I just want to license it out to a company or I want to do this. Even, even if we could, like, I don't know if we could have, but like it, Whereas when you're just doing something more transactional mm -hmm. and a lot of the businesses I did before that were like, I thought of something and I tried to build a business and I tried to sort of like, and I was always frustrated because it was, it was like more transactional. The mission, and that's where I think mission in business is as powerful as it gets, um, really directs every decision you have and, and can superpower and build something that's, you know, the next level of business. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and you've mentioned the importance of mission kind of being your guiding North Star and in a lot of different um, decision making processes once you have a company up and running. So I imagine that's very early in, in the game. You want to try to establish what that's going to be for, for a new venture. But right when you're kind of you're still in the garage, you got your notepad full of ideas, you got your journal full of ideas and you're kind of sifting through to decide, you know, First of all, how do you have that discernment of which one you want to bet on? Are you looking for already kind of a hint of what a mission might be for a certain idea? Or does that kind of come later in the process? So, so sadly, I learned, I learned this all sort of afterwards. <laughs> so like, I wish it was, you know, I'd been able to sit down and it would have been great. I, I, I wish I'd listened to my talk now then. <laughs> yeah. um, what happened was I was this frustrated serial entrepreneur and it was because I, I didn't have that mission. I was, I would, I would have a great idea mm -hmm. or I'd have what I thought was a great <laughs> idea. Let me just say, let me like, you know, <laughs> but like I felt it was a great idea and I'd get into the business and realize that for whatever reason, it didn't have like all the legs or didn't, you know, or maybe I didn't even have the passion for it. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up doing, which was this, this sort of the start of this journey that put me in the right at least position was going in the garage I decided I was just gonna have whatever idea and invent around them and sort of let the market tell me. I was gonna let people sort of decide what I should go do longer and not me the other way around saying like, this is my business and I'm gonna push it. Mm. So we put out a lot of different things. Snap Garden, you know, this modular gardening thing I was putting out there. And we had a thing called Pokety Poke, which would uh, go on your calendar. Mm -hmm. And when, you're, when you had a call, a, a conference call, it would call you like a minute before and put you into the conference oh, call. Yeah. So you never miss the conference call. Mm -hmm. So I was trying all these different things. And again, with Ring, it, it just, it like my wife, and then we we put it up for pre-sale because we were kind of playing around. This was a Kickstarter and mm -hmm. and and uh, Indiegogo were all kind of coming about. And it was then, so it was not only my wife, then it was other people were buying it and they were saying, hey, I'm buying this because the house next door to me was robbed when no one was home. Mm -hmm. And with this, when I'm at the market, I remember this one woman in Stockton, California, like emailed me and she's like, and, and now with this, if I was at the market and someone rang my doorbell, I can say like, I'm acting like I'm home. And I was like, wow, like they, not only does my wife, like my wife like it and she, but, but like people are seeing the power of this. And that, again, that was, it sort of led us to AHA. So your ability then to kind of put a couple of smaller bets then on some prototypes or some some things that you could get to market to yep. test and really get that invaluable kind of user customer feedback yep. that was more kind of guiding you rather than any kind of gut instinct of like this is my this is going to be my 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 product and that was that was guiding me and then I also was I, I think I was also uh waiting for the thing that also that I wanted to you know and again like I think if it was just the doorbell I would not have had the passion for it like building a gadget um but seeing that we could actually do something bigger around like I that was when I realized like it was it was that email from that woman in Stockton um, for whatever reason was the we can build a new way of doing home security mm -hmm. like that was that was like this and that all of a sudden like my invention excitement pat like it, that was like that is a that is something you can work on forever gotcha. and that got me really excited and so I think it is like if you can find that thing that gets you that 
that you feel like no matter what, like, I don't care if you've got a business, like I, I want to work on this thing. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, at least it's a good chance maybe of success. I mean, like, as you know, like the reality is if you try to do your own business, you're probably going to fail anyway. So at least try to fail doing something that you like. Yeah. You mentioned several times uh, the importance of, of having great support and, and sounding board of, of your wife uh, as kind of being someone that can help you through this kind of process, help you clarify ideas, help you maybe see things you hadn't realized yep. before. Whenever you are, you know, the importance of community obviously is, is huge for an entrepreneur and nobody can do this alone. And so having the right people in your corner is paramount to helping you find success. Whenever you're looking to start building then a team, and you're saying, okay, who do I want to, who do I want in my corner? Who do I want to surround myself with? What kind of qualities are you looking for, um, whether it's a, a partner or an investor yep. or just an employee to kind of make sure that that kind of support um, can be reciprocated and, and continue to grow? So this is when I get boring because I keep answering the, like every question you ask, I just answer it like, it's the mission. <laughs> it, it's like funny, but it is the mission. Like, it, because what you want to do is surround yourself with people that are aligned with what you're trying to achieve. So an investor, you, you want them more aligned on the mission than the financials. Because mm. the problem with financials is they're very short term. Um, and in order to build something great, it's long term. And you have to go through these short term dips and valley, you know, peaks and valleys. And so you want someone who's aligned with you. That it's not a, it, You still have to want to build something. And obviously, there's, there's, there are fiduciaries to their funds. But yeah. you want someone who's like in 10 years, like as long as we do this, like like even if we just try, it's at least good for the world. So you want someone who's like aligned with you like that and then have employees and team members that are aligned with you on that, that they're here just as much for the journey and doing something right. And they feel this is the good, a good mission mm -hmm. as, you know, getting paid because in a job market like this, you can sort of make money anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and then your customers, like it also aligns your customers, you know, your customers, we call our customers neighbors mm -hmm. and they become this super force that also helps because they join with you in this mission. So it does, it sort of it aligns everyone. And to your broader point is like, it does take a village. You mm -hmm. know, it, it's not one person. One person builds nothing ever, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, it is a team of lots of people. It's the families of those people. It's, a, it's, it's like, it goes out so broad um, how much support you really need to build something great. Mm -hmm. So um, who specifically then maybe stands out in looking back on your journey as being a, a great member of support or either that helped you in shaping the mission or just helping you through kind of the tough times of the ups and downs of getting things yeah. off the ground? So it's, it, I mean, it definitely, I, I had a lot of mentors. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. A lot of them are different. So there's a lot of people that came in at different sort of points along the way. Mm -hmm you know, when I sort of needed support in some one particular area. So there was investors that were great su super early on and they were still great, but they weren't as, I'll say, impactful as we got bigger. Then there was yeah. investors that were great, you know, when we were bigger. Um, but it's it's amazing how many people, you know, I could probably point to a hundred people through the course of Ring that, you know, really helped affect the the sort of what we were able to, to build and, and the impact we had. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say like none of them sort of stick out, but it is, it's, it's interesting how there's so many that if they hadn't been there at certain times, like, I don't know if we would have made it, which is, mm. you know, goes into that whole luck yeah. thing, which is like, sometimes you also have to get some luck on your side. Were there any other kind of similar surprises to you kind of along this entrepreneurial journey that, that maybe you just couldn't figure out how that worked or whether it be good or bad, yeah. uh, that kind of like was a little bit of a curveball for you that you had to adapt to. Well, the thing that surprised me the most is the competitors that came into the market against us who were the best funded mm. usually did the worst. Really? And my analogy to that is if you know wine at all, um, I'm like, I drink anything, so I'm not like a special wine person, mm -hmm. but if you know wine, the, the best wine comes from hillside grapes because they're stressed just right. Mm -hmm. um, now they're not killed, like they're not like they have some water, but like but they're not overly watered. They're not overly fertilized. They're the the, the hillside sort of keeps them a little bit drier, and so it stresses the grape to create like this perfect grape that then creates great wine. Mm -hmm. And if you put a grape like in a marsh and it just has all the water, all the fertilizer, just like it's a, like a giant juicy, terrible grape to make wine. Mm. And so I think what happened is when you overfund something, mm -hmm. you become uh, I don't want to say lazy, but you sort of make you make bad decisions because you have too much. Mm. And we never had the opportunity to make, I never had the opportunity to waste. Mm. Like we, we didn't have that, even the ability to do that because we were always sort of tight on money. Even when we raised what was big numbers to the outside world, mm -hmm. inside for what we were trying to do, 
it was still tight. Like it wasn't enough to sort of get to where we were going. And so it was always sort of a challenge. And so I, I think that is the, probably the most interesting thing is that the, the, the best funded is not actually gonna have usually the best outcome. Hmm. What do you think is something that a lot of entrepreneurs get wrong? My first product, I remember sitting outside and you know, we had like a little barbecue and I you know, some said, what are you working on? I said, oh, and, you know, you know, and they literally, like, they, they're like, this is, you're making doorbells. Like they la like, literally laughed at me. I mean, like, like belly laughed. <laughs> Um, which is, you know, yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny for you, but like at the time for me, like it wasn't Very that hurtful. funny. Like, yeah. like it was like, you know, like, here I am, like, where, and I'm like <laughs> pouring my heart into this thing in my garage on Monday morning, you know, and it's like Sunday afternoon, I'm getting laughed at. And yeah. so it does kind of affect you. And I think, so I think a lot of times that you have to, it is those things. And so it's like, wh why would you work on that? Well, because you actually, why did I go back in the garage on Monday morning after being laughed at? Because I was passionate about it. I thought I was doing something. And so I, I think the thing we get wrong is, through those getting laughed at, you change your direction, you sort of, you continually go more linear. Mm. And then you kind of wonder like two years later, it's like, why did I not build something great? It's because like every decision you made was right mm -hmm. versus, versus a little bit sort of edgy, aggressive towards something that no one could see. So it's better to kind of embrace that discomfort as long as you are still confident in the purpose, the mission, Kind of yeah, it's, it, exactly. it's also like, don't just jump off the cliff to jump off the cliff, yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. but, but it is, a, it's like, what does your gut say? Mm -hmm. Like you, 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 and that's, you know, the greatest inventors, the greatest CEOs, the greatest founders, like you go through, it's the greatest sports athletes. Like they do something a little bit different mm -hmm. to just, you know, Tom Brady, like they, like his, his diet's different. Like mm -hmm. he just, you know, like, and so you have to do something that's like what you believe is the right thing. And you know, so sadly, the problem is it's not advice because it doesn't always work out. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, we've, we've talked about, you know, a lot of great things of sifting through the lists, how to make a kind of a small bet, let the market kind of give you some feedback on, hey, this idea has legs. So hopefully everybody has that, that trusty partner, that trusty friend at home that can uh, sort of be there in their corner. It, it takes a village. But for, for people who are watching this, who are kind of on the cusp of getting ready to muster up the courage to start one of these endeavors. What do you think is a great sort of catalyzing agent to say, this is how you can kind of get off to the races. Oh, I, I do get, I mean, I get asked a lot, like it's, it's sort, of, sort of, how do you do it? And looking back, I, like mathematically, I don't think we could have done it. So it's one of those, <laughs> I don't know how to explain violating physics. Um, <laughs> that's what you're gonna have to do. Uh -huh. I mean, because it's, the world's not made to allow you to be successful. The world's not sort of built to allow you to build a business. It's, it's just, so we're not created for that. So you have to, in essence, almost break physics or sort of break the system in some way to sort of launch this thing. And so you have to figure out with your, whatever that is. And it's, it's, it's really dependent usually like on that exact thing. And then also timing, you know, what, what helped Ring get to where it was probably doesn't even exist anymore. I mean, the social networks that we were advertising on mm -hmm. have, have moved on to different social networks today. I mean, TikTok didn't exist even two years ago. Yeah. And now it's a huge platform. And so like, you just look at like, and each time something like that happens, it opens up opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you have to find and figure out with what you're doing and with what's happening right now, like what is your entrance to that flow to get into it, to sort of break that physics and go. And like I said, it, it's the, the reason a mission is great is because then at least you have that passion to stick with it because your first entry might, you might hit a wall. Mm -hmm. And so if you hit that wall and I've seen it, you know, and you just turn around and go back, you're the person who says, which you hear all the time, like, I did that also, I just didn't make it. And it's yeah. like, okay, well, like that's because you didn't keep going. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really fail is to stop. You've mentioned also before, like it's a lot of people come to you looking for answers, looking for solutions, right? How, how can I replicate your success? How can I be just like you when I grew up sort of a thing? And it, you're right, it's impossible to give anyone an answer or a solution because like you said, the change is just, just Yeah, permanent. just one factor of just time yeah. means that whatever I did would not work, like doing the same set of things that we did to get Ring to where it is would not work today. Mm -hmm. It's just it, the, like, there's learnings. I think mission is a great learning. I think mm -hmm. working hard is a great learning. But but other than that, I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's different. It's going to be. So instead of offering just kind of a one size fits all solution, what would be a better question that uh, a budding entrepreneur could be continuously asking themselves to make sure they're kind of at least on the right track? You know, probably the right track is like, are, are you doing what you believe in your heart is the right thing to get 
X, Y, Z, whatever you're, you're trying to do out. Mm -hmm. um, because those are the toughest decisions. I remember we got very early on in Ring, uh, we got approached by a very large manufacturer of um, a product that's adjacent to ours. And they mm -hmm. said, we'd like to have a, a doorbell like yours mm -hmm. and we'd like you to make it for us. And you know, Ring's mission was around making neighborhoods safer. It wasn't about being a, a financially responsible company producing product for someone else under their brand. Yeah. And so I thought about it. I'm like, wow, if we don't have the customer, if we don't have the, like, we're just a, we're just a manufacturer, mm -hmm. which, you know, at the time, I mean, would have been, would have quadrupled our sales. I mean, it would have been huge for the business. Mm -hmm. But in my gut, in my heart, it would have directed us down a path that would have directed resources and everything else towards something where I didn't want to go. I didn't want to run that business. I didn't think that business would, you know, end up where I, where I wanted it from an impact side. Mm -hmm. And so we said, no. Mm. I, mean, one of the I mean, tough. And, and by the yeah. way, when you say no to that company, they don't say, that's great. You know, we're not going to go into your business um, now because you're so missionary. <laughs> like, we like you and, yeah. and just best of luck to you, buddy. Like, they're like, we're going to crush you and yeah. someone else will do this. You're declaring Similar. war. Yeah. You've declared war. Yeah. And that's tough. Like, and, and we were very small. Like, we were not at the size where you could feel like we're two armies fighting. You know, this is like, we were like two armies and we were like one person with a maybe, I don't know, like a slingshot. Um, and, and so that's that's really really tough, and it's, so it's it's the nose mm -hmm. as you grow that direct you. And again, that yes would have been it would have directed us down a linear path, mm. um, and it would have taken us into a place where maybe we still built built a business, but certainly not something as impactful as what Ring has become. So sticking with your or prioritizing your mission goals over your fundraising goals yeah. is what allowed you. And, to yeah, and even like I'd say like mission, but on this it's also what do you what's in your like heart, your soul, your gut mm -hmm. to get, you know, the answers. I, I think most entrepreneurs know the answer. Mm -hmm. I'll say I've, I've, I've definitely made the wrong decision many times and I would never fault anyone for doing it because it's hard. Yeah. So at most fundable companies, uh, there are thousands of, of entrepreneurs who are looking to, they're looking for growth. They're looking for investment. They're looking for revenue. If you were in their shoes, um, what would what would they what would you recommend they start thinking about or what are they what should they be prioritizing when they're in that stage you know i i believe that a great business will always get funded in any market mm -hmm. and so what i mean by that is a lot of times you start to see you start to look at like what will make me look like a good company mm -hmm. and again you make decisions like maybe that example of that company if i'd done that deal would have made us look good we would have had bigger revenue yeah but but really what builds a great company and what builds your great company? And I think if you do that long term, I always think, I mean, Amazon has this thing where they say, like, we're willing to be misunderstood. Mm -hmm. And what they mean by that is, is they'll think long term on something because in the short term, someone might say, like, why are you doing that? Because it's because it's to get to where and that's what we, we were willing to sort of do what didn't maybe look rational at the time. But I, I felt it was going to build a great company. And I felt like if I did that, there would always be money there. And I believe, I, I, I believe in any market, down markets, up markets, there's always money for great companies. You have a great story of your, your in interaction with Shark Tank, right? First of all, it's already a very rare opportunity to be able to go on that. I know you put a lot of work, a lot of your, your yep. precious funds, especially early on for that moment. And you know, even though the, the, the deal didn't quite ink right then like you had imagined, you later come back being the most successful company that's ever been on the show. And then you personally even return as a shark onto the show, which I imagine is such a surreal experience. How has kind of been being on both sides of the table there, so to speak, kind of with the investor mindset and the entrepreneur mindset, have those kind of influenced how you take those two approaches any differently? So, well, I mean, the, first of all, I, I try to be a humble person. Um, I think I am. That one made it tough. I mean, I mean, getting, <laughs> I mean, you know, you being on, on the, like, like being on the show, I felt was, you know, like an amateur athlete getting in the Olympics. You know, it was like that to me, like being on it as an entrepreneur was that was like, the, like going into the Olympics, mm -hmm. being the biggest company ever to be on there was winning the gold medal of the biggest event in the Olympics. Like that was to me, like being able to go back on. I mean, it's just like, I couldn't even think of the metaphor for that. Like that was, that was my, like, I mean, never happened before. Yeah. Mind blowing. Um, so yeah, just like to put that aside, like that was incredible. It's funny, I did a couple of shows. I love doing it. I realized that I can't do it because when I get into, you know, the, the business I'm involved in, Moink, mm -hmm. which is a meat company I invested off of this, uh, this woman, Lucinda, is an amazing entrepreneur. I spend 
a lot of time with her. And I realized that like, I am not scale about this. I'm not an investor. <laughs> I love being into it. I can't separate myself. And so I couldn't do 20 things. I can't even really do two. Mm -hmm. um, so what I did realize from that is I'm not an investor. I'm, I'm not I'm not the mindset of an investor. I like to, when I get into something, be all in on it. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm not gonna be all in, then I just would rather sort of not have a meaningful play. I mean, I, uh, you know, so. Gotcha, so that's probably more of your kind of inventor side coming out, wanting to be sort of in the trenches and be involved. Yeah. I can't help myself. <laughs> And so it's not, a, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. And time and focus are the limiters of, you know, life and success and everything else. If you get involved in too many things, you will like, you know, you will fail. Like you, you and you'll even fail not financially. You'll fail at being a, a real impact to mm. people. So the Pepperdine Grad Studio uh, Business School, which hosts and runs the, the most fundable companies event, um, really prides itself on focusing that they create best for the world leaders. It's meaning that, you know, the need for value, the need for ethics, the need for uh, mission yep. is central to an entrepreneur's work. And since that's kind of a theme that has come up here, how would you say that even say your, your personal motivations, your personal missional drives in life in general have influenced you as an entrepreneur, how you would run a company? It's interesting when you look at the most valuable companies in the world, um, I mean, maybe at some point they get so big that they get a life of their own, but the ones that as they come up, if you sort of look at the stories, Mm -hmm. Almost all of them were of high ethics, high values, high, you know, high on mission, mm -hmm. founders that that really cared about what they were doing for the world. I, I do think the world is going even more and more towards that. Mm -hmm. I think the most valuable companies that we'll see come out of the next 10 or 20 years and, and long term sustainable companies will be that. I think sustainability is going to be a huge part of the next sort of generation of companies. So I think it's I think it is our responsibility to do that, to be the sort of shepherds of, you know, like through entrepreneurship of, mm -hmm. of this. Um, and I also think it's financially actually gonna be very beneficial to do that. When there's a lot of ebbs and flows in a company, you've talked about wanting to have a really long-term view of things. Um, something as critically important and guiding as a mission. Is that something that should evolve with a company or is that basically remain static throughout the life? You know, I, I like to, with Ring, we were lucky and, you know, maybe but like to have a mission that was an infinite truth. Mm. You know, Ring's mission of making neighborhoods safer never has to change. It's it's so big that you could, I don't think you could ever fill it out with products in it. Like you never fill, fill it out with invention. You can never fill the, that sort of, mm -hmm. you can also probably never solve it. Mm. Like making a neighborhood safer, like could we make, because it, it would be like, could you make every neighborhood safer around the world? To 100%. Mm -hmm. and the answer is probably no, which is this infinite truth, which allows us to work on it forever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think when you have missions, sometimes they get um, they get mis sort of construed as goals. Like a mission is to do something that becomes a goal and the goal is actually achievable. And when you have an achievable goal, that's actually a ceiling. So to me, it's not something to shoot for. It's actually something to hit when you're shooting. Mm. And so I, I like when a company has something that's sort of infinite, that it's it, it's almost, it's you can see where it goes. You, you know, if you talk to someone, mm -hmm. make neighborhood safer, that's tangible, mm -hmm. but it's infinite. So that to me is what you want to try to work towards as a business is something that you could never achieve, but you it's tangible of how you could get there. So this sounds like it almost ties in. You have a very interesting kind of corporate cultural practice at Ring about no celebrating and no celebrating rule, right? How would you say, you know, in regards to how you treat goal management, how does that tie in with what you're just talking about? So the no celebration rule is not, it, it comes across and it is a bit pithy or like, it's kind of a clickbaity. Yeah. Like it's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh, you say no celebration, people are like, oh, you know, it's like, it, it shocks you. It's not meant to say like, don't actually celebrate. Like we celebrate lots of things. We're very, we're not sad people. Mm -hmm. But what it is meant to say is don't, so um, by celebration, it means you're setting a goal mm -hmm. and you, you have a like a specific thing for that goal. And so by not setting these sort of like, we're gonna get to a hundred million in revenue. Cause if, if we had set that goal, we probably would have, maybe we would have gotten to a hundred million. Mm -hmm. But that year that we would have set that goal, we, we actually probably got to 200. By not having the goal, we actually hit higher. And I, I do think we would have created a ceiling. So it does that. Mm -hmm. It's also for your customers. Like if, you're, if you are super customer focused, why are you celebrating? Mm -hmm. Like does every single customer that you sold to, are they, have you done the right perfect thing for them? Have you delivered a perfect product for them, a perfect experience, everything you could do? I would say never, I don't think it's, it's even possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, it's like, rather than having a big celebration, why don't you work on that next problem you need to fix for your customers mm -hmm. or that next thing you wanna build for them?
You have also mentioned uh, in the past that varying levels of challenges came up whenever you were, you were getting a ring off the ground. Even coming close to insolvency, probably more than a couple of times. That's something that everybody, every entrepreneur out there can, can relate to because that feels like such a dead end to say, to always be worried about, okay, the money runs out on this yeah. day. What do I do the day after that? And you've done that more than, on more than one occasion. How do you find how to push through something like that? So, uh, you know, again, mission, mm -hmm. um, because it is, it's, it's, it, you are with a mission, you are doing something bigger than the money, bigger than the business. Mm -hmm. Um, I also found share it with your, share the, with your village, mm -hmm. you know, with, with your team, your family or whatever. Don't hold that. I think a lot of people try to hold it because it's a weakness. Yeah. And I think you get strength from sharing the weakness. Mm -hmm. And so I would share with everyone, like we're out of money. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. You'd think, you'd think that like if you were working for Ring and I said, we're out of money, you'd, you, you'd think that you just leave, like you go get another job. It's the opposite. It's, it's you know, it's like you're now more, you're, we have to make this work. Like I'm part of this now, I'm part of something bigger. It's, and, and money is a, interestingly, a bad motivator for employees. Like it, it's, it's, it's a commodity, whereas emotion and like what, what, what motivates us in life is not, I mean, we need money to do things, but it's not the motivation of life. Mm -hmm. And so it's amazing when you start to you know, say to someone, hey, like we're out of money, wh where are we gonna get it from? I don't know, but, but I'm gonna try and we're gonna make this happen and we're gonna make this work and we're not gonna stop. And it's like, and now when you get it, now the team is so much stronger. Mm. And now that- kind of went through that, that lull. Yeah, and then that strength is scalable because all of those people that were around for that, when you get new people, tell that story. Mm -hmm. And so then like, so it just that it spreads that strength up. So then, you know, speaking of different um, financial moments, uh, f you know, investment moments, were there any um, particular either rounds of funding or, or specific investors that stood out to you in your journey that was a real kind of watershed moment to you that influenced so, things? So we had, I mean, we had, we got very lucky early on to have, a, I mean, I was missionary, so I, I think I was, I was exuding that and that was attracting good investors. But truthfully, like in some of our early rounds, I probably would have taken money from the wrong person. <laughs> um, you know, someone who was maybe just financial or just what, just because yeah. I had to, like we, we, there were desperate times calls for desperate measures. Okay. But there was the, 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 there was a round when we finally got bigger that I actually, you know, we had the luxury of, you know, trying to pick our investor. Mm -hmm. And so I did this thing where I did three different uh, present, like three files, like a PowerPoint, but it was like three broken into three sections. Mm -hmm. Each section when it ended felt like it was the end of the presentation. So the first part was all around mission. Uh -huh. And you'd see, you know, you'd, you'd see an investor, you know, look and say like, yeah, I don't, I don't see this as a business. And they would, and then you say, thank you very much. And you'd, you'd walk away. And then the person would be like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. Like you could build this product off of this. And they, you know, we already had the doorbell, but they started, wow, you could build, you're wanting to build a lot more. You want to go broader. And I said, yes. And then I go into the next file. <laughs> and that was the whole product roadmap. Uh -huh. And it had a lot of stuff that now you see out there, but didn't at the time was not out in the market. And they, 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 that investor would either say, yeah, but I don't know how you're going to sell any of this stuff. And they, you know, kind of, eh, like I'm not that interested. Mission and product, eh. Or you have the person say, wow, okay, so this is gonna lead to a great business because if you get you know, your customers and blah, 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 and then I'd say, oh, let me show you the financials. <laughs> the financials at the time, like we were selling way bigger like numbers than people thought. Yeah. And so you go through that and they say, like, I wanna invest. But that was, you know, you, you cut that way down. I do remember when we sold, one of the people who only saw presentation number one, mm -hmm. uh, so they, they, they called me and said like, if you, why didn't you show me how big you were? I didn't no idea. Blah, blah, blah. I said, well, like, you failed the first test, like, <laughs> you know, and, and you weren't, you weren't right for us. And it was, it was just someone who was, he, he they, he was mad because he missed an investment. Mm. He wasn't mad because we built something great. He wasn't mad because we built something impactful and he wasn't involved in it. Mm. He wasn't, you know, he was, the, and so we wanted people that really wanted to be involved because we were building something impactful. And the output of that would be a great business. That's a great way to put it because it's so difficult to have that sort of mission-based filter especially on investors, when, which is somebody that's kind of obviously critical to, to, yeah. the, to the process, but isn't directly kind of working under you through the whole, every step of the way. But wow, do they direct your business? <laughs> I mean, you know, it, 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 wrong investors mm -hmm. will be, I, I, even the toughest entrepreneurs, the toughest inventors, whoever, it, like, it is very tough to go against if you have a bad pool of investors in mm -hmm. that are telling you something to do 
uh, it is that is very tough to like you know the the to go against and a lot of times investors will the wrong investors will try to push you towards linear because mm-hmm. they get scared right and fear turns you to sort of what you can see not what the future is mm-hmm. and so you do you want those believe the, the ones that believe because the people that believe they'll say I, I had investors that would be like Jamie that seems crazy but go do it like you know because they believed in me they believe they believed in the mission they believed in me and they said you know what like I'm just an investor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're crazy, but like at least you're on. You seem to be crazy in a direction, so go for it. Mm-hmm. So then, if there are other you know entrepreneurs out there who are in a stage, a vulnerable stage that you were at when you said, you know, I at a point, you know, I would have almost taken money from anybody. That's a very difficult, even more difficult decision to then say, okay, how can I, you know, not chain myself to the wrong person, or you know, I'm worried that this isn't going to be a missional fit. Is there any? advice uh, that could kind of help decide, all right, well, if you have to choose, if you have a tough call between A and B, kind of go in this direction. I mean, certainly, you know, talk to references. Mm -hmm. If the reference you talk to just had a successful outcome, they're going to say that the investor was great Mm -hmm. because they probably were like, and and even a bad investor is good when things go well, you know, when the, when the tide rises, all the boats go up. Yeah. And so try to find the reference of something that didn't go well. Try to find the reference of someone who had to pivot during their thing. You try to find the reference of the investor that says, yeah, this person was really with me because mm-hmm. um, that's what the mission thing is. It's not that you want them to believe in the mission. You want someone to be with you mm-hmm. because you are the you're the leader. You're the one who has to make decisions. It's your gut. You know, we, we know that multiple chefs in a kitchen don't make a great meal. Mm-hmm. And so there needs to be one chef. And the problem that happens when strong investors get in that are not with you and not uh, really believing in you is it becomes another chef. Mm. And then just, you know, sometimes it works, but it's really just luck then because mm-hmm. then you're not you're not directing it. It's just kind of a stew that everyone's throwing some ingredients in. So back to the very beginning of this conversation, we were talking about how, you know, you would more primarily see yourself as an inventor rather than an entrepreneur, even though there's a lot of overlap between the two of those things. How do you balance, you know, the the passion and the thrill you get from sort of tinkering in the garage versus the necessary demands of actually wanting the result of that to be shepherded through and stewarded correctly through the running of a company. Is that a difficult balance to strike? So you, you, you try to definitely try to hire team members around you that can do the things that you're not good at. So mm-hmm. the more operational things. And then I also focus my inventor mind on problems in the business. So it's not just about, to me, invention is not just literally building like the physical product and where the button goes. Yeah. Invention could be as, as, you know, it could be that in customer service, Mm-hmm. Um, these types of calls are taking 10 minutes longer to handle and trying to invent a way to get them to be shorter because that's better for the customer and it's better for like, so it's not just the product, it's invention everywhere in the business. I think when you can, I do think invention is a very powerful way of building a business, especially with, you know, again, with what Ring does specifically it is. Mm-hmm. So bringing it all together then, wrapping, wrapping it up, we've talked a lot about, you know, those, those early exciting seed moments you're, where you're scribbling things in the journal in the garage. We've talked about surrounding yourself with a good community that's supporting you, uh, how to make some of those difficult decisions using mission as sort of your guiding North Star principle uh, in your decision making. This is a lot. This is a lot of blood, sweat, and tears for somebody to be an entrepreneur. So at the end, the question is why? Why should somebody want to go through all of these hoops, all these high highs and low lows, for you, what has been that the payoff that makes that worth it? Um, I mean, the payoff is for me is driving down a street in a in a city that I've never been to, um, and seeing a ring doorbell on a house. Hmm. Um, you know, even though I like seeing them around where I live, that's I'd say, I, but like going to a place where you've sort of never been and seeing what you created, not only on the house, but knowing it's probably delivering something to that homeowner. That's as exciting as it gets. And that's that's really the fulfillment of it that, you know, makes, I'd say, it all worthwhile because it was tough. And there was a lot of times when it didn't look like it was going to work. And so that's the that's the payoff. That's great. Well, thank you so much for coming out here, Jamie. We really appreciate you sharing your your insights, your wisdom, not the not the advice, but all of, all the yeah. other uh, great stories that you've you've been and able to, to thanks share. Thanks and good luck, and I hope to see lots of inventions and businesses that you know flourish in the next ten years from them. We're excited, yeah. Most fundable companies, I'm sure, will will come up with quite a quite a few over That's, the next few years. I'm I'm sure of it. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, thanks. Wow. 
Thank you to Jamie Simonoff of Ring and Landon Phillips of the Singleton Foundation for inspiring all of us to see the impact that mission-driven work can have, not only on a single company, but also on the world at large. Welcome everyone. I'm Amy Wood of the Grazia Dio School, and I have the privilege to say that every year, the Most Fundable Companies program serves as a free resource to thousands of startups. For the second year in a row, they came from all 50 states, 3,300 in total, vying for one of the spaces on the list we bring to you today. To those less familiar with our program, we're different from a pitch competition in that we educate founders and focus on the investor diligence process. And each of the companies you will see today is seeking investment. So let's transition right into our list winners and how they will be announced. As Craig mentioned earlier, we have 16 winning companies presenting today who in total comprise one most fundable companies list with four categories, platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. The rationale behind our four categories is that they allow for some distinction among the winners, but more importantly, they reinforce that we consider all 16 as fundable. What's really fun is that each company knows they've earned a spot on the list, but even they still don't know who falls where. Companies will be announced by category level, starting with bronze, and we'll work our way up to platinum. Companies within each category will be announced in alphabetical order. As we go through the winner announcements, pay attention. Starting at the close of the live stream today, you'll have the chance to vote for your favorite startups out of all 16 list winners. We'll let you know more about where to go and how to vote a little later. And now, we introduce to you, for the first time, the 2021 Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies. Leading off our bronze category, which includes four startups in total, we bring you a founding team that includes an 11 time Emmy winner and his co-founder who has experience working with brands such as Beats by Dre, Apple, GoPro, and Sony. And Evonex's startup technology incubator company, let's hear it for team Advanced Image Robotics. Hello, I'm Nick Nordquist, co-founder of Advanced Image Robotics. At AIR, we're on a mission to make live event video radically less expensive, simpler, and more sophisticated. This video is being captured by our AIR-1, a high-resolution cinematic camera robot. It's controlled by a remote operator using an iPad. It's the front end of the AIR ecosystem that lets producers bypass expensive hardware and conduct broadcast operations from anywhere. Why is this important? Viewer demand for live streaming video is huge. It's a $30 billion market today and predicted to grow to $247 billion over the next few years. Direct-to-viewer channel offerings are exploding, and mid-tier broadcasters will need to offer more sophisticated content on smaller budgets to win and retain those viewers. Traditional production can't scale cost-effectively to meet this demand because it relies on outdated technology that requires workflows that are complex, capital-intensive, and labor-intensive. The solution is the Air One platform. On the front end, our robotic cameras and app-based control deliver high-end video directly to the cloud. On the back end, we convert the old traditional hardware into cost-effective cloud computing software. AI also comes into play as our control system grows smarter over time. Sound expensive? Not at all. At an under 10K buy-in, the Air One costs less than most solutions currently in use, and it features far more sophisticated functionality. The Air Cloud component means that broadcasters don't need to roll truckloads of gear to the site. The massive cost savings make adopting the Air ecosystem a no-brainer for most of the middle market. And it's good business for us too. It starts with system sales of the Air One. Our enterprise customer base will want multiple cameras and the benefits of our subscription SaaS. Video storage, remote collaboration, live streaming, and multicam control. Through this, we capture more of our customers' workflow, and it's still radically less expensive for them because it eliminates most of the CapEx. Our exec team boasts over 100 years of experience in tech, as well as film and TV production. Our individual accomplishments include some of the biggest product rollouts in consumer technology, 11 Emmy Awards, past entrepreneurial experience, and several patents. We're raising a seed round of $950,000 to go faster. 
We've bootstrapped over the last year, and with 200K, we've built working prototypes, filed for IP, and are currently field testing with beta customers. Here's some footage of our cameras in action on a four hour live stream broadcast. Thank you for your consideration. Please reach out to us for more information or to see more video. Next up in bronze, we have a Boston-based 2021 Mass Challenge Accelerator startup that is led by a multi-time founder. Congratulations to Team Jackson. Hello, Jackson is an AI training platform used by data science teams to label data, which is the biggest bottleneck in the AI creation process today. Without Jackson, data science teams take months to label enough data to properly train AI, essentially give it enough examples to learn from. And not only are the humans slow and costly, they make a ton of mistakes. It's at the core of why many AI initiatives fail. Meet Jackson. Jackson automates as much of the labeling process as possible. Raw data comes into an assembly line that adjusts to the domain-specific data and defined problem spec. Then through a series of algorithms and an iterative cycle of human input, Jackson outputs training data, labeled and curated. Here's a case study we did with a top 10 retailer. They had 400,000 return comments they needed labeled. Their human labeling team took 200 FTE weeks to deliver. Jackson took two. Their data science team then took another four weeks to build a model. Jackson did it in less than a day. So much faster, way more cost effective, and notice, more accurate. Greg and I met at MIT almost 20 years ago, and this is our fourth company together. The last one was a machine learning consulting firm that we grew over the course of six years and got acquired in 2019. Jackson was conceived at that company. We did all the initial R&D through that company, and then we spun it out at the closing. There's a huge market for Jackson. The US Department of Defense alone is spending a billion and a half per year on AI. Speaking of DOD, we have three awards with the Air Force and are considered a dual use company. On the commercial side, we're targeting retailers, financial services, and insurance. Our competitors are predominantly the, these human labeling shops. We're focused on regulated industries, those that have sensitive data and don't want a bunch of random humans gaining access to it, and they want the speed and accuracy that Jackson brings. We also have two patents pending and a technology moat we've been building for the past five years. We invested 1.6 million into R&D through our previous company, and then raised a $1.5 million seed round last year. We're raising a $5 million Series A now, mostly to focus on ramping up the go-to-market and continuing to add in functionality. I welcome a conversation with anyone interested. My email is scott at jackson.ai. We hope you like getting to know these incredible startups as much as we have. Amy mentioned crowd favorite voting earlier. Voting opens later today and goes through November 1st at the URL on the screen. Vote for your favorite startups out of all 16 list winners. Also important to note is that when you visit our event website, in addition to the 16 most fundable companies list winners, we are featuring all of our 2021 semifinalists and finalists, 70 startups in total. These are great companies, so be sure to check them all out. Now for the third company in the bronze category, we have an LA based startup with a female co-founder and a CEO who is working on his next exit. I am pleased to introduce Lieben and CERN, DBA Crossworld. Hi, I'm Julio CERN, co-founder of Crossworld. We are a Los Angeles-based MarTech SaaS platform for brand marketers to manage and scale influence campaign. Crosswell incorporates machine learning to make hyper-intelligent decisions regarding influencer selection and posting patterns. So that way, brand marketers can launch micro-influencer campaigns with confidence and avoid the hassle of managing brand-safe social media posts, 
vetting, and qualifying the influencers. For our brand customers, we help them execute a viable campaign while reducing the labor time associated with finding the best performing influencer. And the data and analytics we generate help them make better demographics targeting decisions. This flows into their marketing budget, reducing overall resources required, and boosting their return on investment. This is a significant and prominent challenge for the industry. And for our micro-influencers, we help them execute campaign goals and objectives via our intuitive gamification platform. And the data and analytics we generate help them make better content and posting schedules to achieve the campaign KPIs. This flows into their professional development, reducing overall posting errors and boosting their monetary value as a micro-influencer. This is also a significant and prominent challenge for the industry. Crossfold is live with paying customers such as Hewitt Pack Enterprise, The Match Group, Baby Trend and others, and we have onboarded over 1,200 influencers on our platform. We are bootstrapped by the founders. We are post-revenue with $30,000 in monthly recurring revenue and now raising our first institutional round of $2 million. We will be using these funds to support our ongoing sales and marketing efforts, accelerate our product development, including the AI behind influencer clustering and intelligent brief creation engines, and expanding our business operations. Our funding team and advisors are successful entrepreneurs and C-suite executives with six successful ventures between us. This is my fourth venture with one exit under my belt. To learn more about Crossworld, visit us on the event website or go to our website, crossworld.net. Thank you, and I look forward to connecting with you. Concluding the bronze category, this next company is compelling in many ways. They have both a multi-time and underrepresented founding team whose company has been recognized as a top 50 healthcare company by the International Forum on Advancements in Healthcare. And they are the recipient of the 2021 Digital Health Innovator Award by the Open Business Council. Congratulations to Telebionics. Hello everyone. My name is Widi Medina, Telebionics co-founder and CEO. First, I want to thank Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies panel for considering our venture worthy of this recognition and the opportunity to share with you our life-saving digital health platform, Remosense. Remosense is the perfect tool for telehealth and remote patient monitoring as it closes every existing gap regarding biosignal information exchange during a teleconsultation session. It is a true all-in-one health data collection and exchange platform that facilitates capturing and sharing of heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, blood oxygenation, eight lead electrocardiography, and heart and not lung audio via our active noise canceling digital stethoscope. In Telebionics, we understand privacy, integrity, and security of user health data. It is for this reason that we provide completely integrated solution, which offers fully compliant data management tools alongside intuitive, clear, and powerful visualization dashboards to increase our RemoSense capability beyond that of a off-the-shelf biometric medical device. We're using AI algorithms that help us improve sensor performance and in parallel correlate all biometric information to a doctor diagnostic. We're tapping into a $485 billion market at a global scale, an incredible 38.2 growth rates in telehealth vertical market by 2025, and 117 billion market projection for remote monitoring alone for the same year. We have witnessed a complete shift in governmental support to digital health as the future of non-critical medical consultation, new laws promoting insurance coverage for RPMs, while doctors are prescribing such devices to better manage their patient volume. This creates the perfect launchpad to promote our product to telehealth providers or healthcare providers. With our product as part of their platform offering, they will enhance services, augment capabilities, and in turn, increase patient doctor retention. All these are a low to no cost from a unit's perspective or a reasonable service charge covered also by insurance providers. Remosense is a healthcare solution for everyone but we see the most impact in people with limited mobility, sensitive health conditions, and where exposure to uncontrolled environment introduces an unnecessary risk. We have established a significant traction across the board. Customer LOIs of $3 million, manufacturing partnerships, R&D agreements with prestigious organizations, and partnerships to accelerate their path to FDA approvals. We understand the importance of legal structure and IP protection, and for that reason, we chose Wilson Sonsini to help us navigate both. 
Telebionics and Remonsense will have never become a reality without the incredible work of our technical, business development, and advisory teams who have developed a full healthcare platform in record time and guided by the highest quality levels. In only three quarters of development, we have managed to create the best biometric platform in the market with the largest potential growth among any of the current alternative technology. Imagine what we can do within the next year with your financial support. We're closing a $1 million seed round and soon to open our Series A round of $4 million as $40 million valuation, 10% equity, at an expected ROI of 3x within the next 12 to 18 months. I invite you to be part of the healthcare transformation and invest in the future of telemedicine remosense. Before we move to our silver category, we'd like to note that some list winners will also be featured tomorrow at SoCal Koretsu Forum's Startup to Exit Quick Pitch and Monthly Investment Forum. Thank you to SoCal Koretsu Chapter President and Most Fundable Companies Advisory Council member, Connie Harrell, for your numerous collaborations with Grazia Dio. Additionally, some list winners will be featured in Pismo Ventures National Venture Plan Competition. Last year, the overall winner and two of the top three companies in the Pismo competition were Pepperdine Grazia Dio Most Fundable Companies. Thank you to Pismo Ventures and JJ Richa for highlighting our Most Fundable Companies to facilitate their funding. Now, in our silver category today, we have six companies. Again, presenting them in alphabetical order by company name, we are pleased to introduce to you a team whose technology was developed out of one of my alma maters, Purdue University. They are an impressive, female and multi-time founded company, an NSF grant awardee, and an alumnus of the Q-Bay Accelerator Program in Silicon Valley focused on diagnostics and personalized medicine. Congratulations to Amplified Sciences. I would like for you to imagine for a moment that you are a patient. You've been having stomach problems for several weeks, so you book an appointment with your primary care physician. She orders a CAT scan because she thinks it might be your gallbladder. The test comes back and there's nothing on your gallbladder. However, she tells you she has to send you a specialist because you have a growth on your pancreas. You go home and Google and do some research and you are scared because you realize this could be pancreatic cancer. And when you see the specialist, he tells you he needs to learn more. He needs more information because you just can't go in and remove it because the surgery is dangerous. You see, there's a growing problem of these pancreatics just showing up in imaging. And doctors don't have the tools they need to know how to manage these patients with cysts. Yet, they have to do something. Pancreatic cancer is the third deadliest cancer with 74 out of patients dead within the first year of diagnosis. Early diagnosis is key. The morbidity of the Whipple procedure to remove these growths is 40%. This costs our healthcare system $4 billion to manage. And unfortunately for the patient, the competitive tests are plagued by both high false positives and high false negatives. All this means there's huge amount of medical need in this market. Let's talk about the market. Just a quick reminder, Amplified Sciences is playing in a larger 88 billion in vitro diagnostic. For our lead test, the first of many, it's a pancreatic cancer diagnostic market of $2 billion. I am Diana Caldwell, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Amplified Sciences. And our solution is PanSys Pro. This uses a small amount of cis fluid to identify whether there's malignancy in that cyst or not. This will be truly a first-in-class, highly accurate assay. And we have a favorable reimbursement rate at $4,000 to follow. Our business model is similar to a company that you may have heard of, Exact Sciences. They're the makers of Colaguard. We have very strong traction to date. We have IP issued and exclusively licensed from Purdue University. We've closed a 1.8 million seed round. And we also have a strong partnership with an instrument partner, Bruker Corporation. Finally, we've procured bank samples and we're about to start clinical testing as we speak. And we're poised to have a commercial ready assay in 12 to 18 months. We have a disruptive technology and the team to make it happen, a very strong mix of scientific, clinical, and commercial in vitro diagnostic talent in-house as well as with our advisory board. And our inventor, my co-founder, and our CSO is Dr. Joe Davidson. He's a chemist at Purdue University in the pharmacy school. We have enjoyed strong external validation here, including clinical cancer centers, federal agencies, and other life science organizations. 
And for investors, it's good to know that Diagnostics is hot with strong M&A activity, strong multiples, and a multi-billion dollar exit here recently. Please join us in changing the face of, of diagnosis of devastating disease, starting with pancreatic cancer. We're poised um, for our Series A, and we're looking for lead VCs by end of 2022 for commercial launch and scale. Thank you. At this time, we'd like to formally acknowledge and send a special waves thank you to Grazia Dio alum Ronald Mummin of JP Morgan as our event gold sponsor, and our alum Garrett Gilbertson of Startup Mavericks as our event silver sponsor. Our resource partners are Diversified Professional Coaching, Flying Point Industries, McCoy Communications, Net Capital, Scherzer International, SoCal IP Law Group, and Stubbs Alderton and Markleys. We'd also like to thank two additional in-kind premium sponsors. Our gratitude is great for Stephen Lehman of Business Rockstars and Stephen Price of Co-Founders Lab. The support of many brings all the pieces of our program together. Our development partner is Michael Cooper of Dataflow Designs, and the following firms provide discounted or pro bono benefits directly to the winning companies. To all these incredible organizations and friends of Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies, thank you. I'm pleased to announce the second company in the silver category. They're also based out of the Midwest, Chicago, Illinois, in fact, and serving one of my former industries, risk analytics. We bring to you Arcs Nimbus. I'm David Moon, CEO and founder of Arcs Nimbus. We prevent cybersecurity losses and bring companies quantitative management of cybersecurity risks. The problem is cybersecurity losses now exceed 700 billion a year. Recently, we worked with a Fortune 10 company whose understanding of their own cyber breach exposure was nearly 90% less than what the actual data showed. A 2020 Swiss Re survey showed that senior management views managing cyber risk as vital to earnings, yet 80% report having no insights to these issues. We solve this by applying a quantitative cloud platform using curated historical data from 20 published sources and an actuarial science-based algorithm. We're the only commercially available solution providing financial cost of cyber risk at a detailed level. We have complete alignment with NIST and ISO standards supporting litigation preparedness, regulatory compliance, risk avoidance, reducing unfunded liabilities, and optimizing strategies and priorities for the cybersecurity program. In our team, we have the former CTO of Outlook and Randian, a chief advisor to the Department of Energy, a Yale University research associate, PhD data scientist from Northwestern University, and a former Air Force intelligence officer and others. Our board consists of the founder of West Point cybersecurity major, head of applications development for Moody's Investor Service, the CEO of Oasis Group, CIO of State of Illinois, and chief accounting officer of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Our traction includes an early stage pilot sponsored by U.S. Strategic Command. We've since been implemented in half a dozen Fortune 1000 companies in healthcare, financial services, technology, and other industries, including Nestle, Amerisource Bergen, Indiana University, Quest Diagnostics, and others. Our U.S. patent was awarded in 2017, international in 2018. We're one of the top 500 cybersecurity solutions in Momentum Partner Cyberscape, we're a finalist for the 2020 Chicago Innovation Awards. We've been covered by Gartner analysts as top innovative cybersecurity risk management solution. And repeat customers include extended subscriptions through 2024. We currently have a dozen formal reseller channel partner ag agreements in place. We're in the service now in Microsoft Azure marketplaces. And we have over 500,000 in ARR as of Q3 of 2021, with two and a half million in a currently active proposals in the pipeline. We're raising three to four million in funding for marketing and biz dev, SEO, publicity, inside sales, and adding industry verticals along the way. 
This next silver category company is unique in that it has underrepresented and multi-time founders, and unlike many, can boast participation in third derivative, Caltech Rocket Fund, and the Wells Fargo Innovation Incubator. As if that wasn't enough, they have received grants from Oak Ridge National Lab, NYSERDA Next Generation Air Conditioning, and the Department of Energy Technology Commercialization Fund. Are you ready to join me in congratulating Team Blue Frontier? Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Betts, CEO of Blue Frontier. Right now, I am feeling quite comfortable because I am in an air-conditioned building. However, air conditioning has a sinister side effect. They are a major energy hog and the chemical refrigerants they use are more than a thousand times more powerful greenhouse gases than carbon dioxide. The world is warming and as this occurs, air conditioning usage is exploding, being the fastest growing use of electricity in the planet. Without a significant change, it is estimated that in 2050, air conditioning electricity consumption will be as much as the whole of India and China today, erasing sustainability and climate mitigation efforts. The International Energy Agency has stated that air conditioning is one of the most important blind spots in our fight against climate change. But don't despair, we have a solution. At Blue Frontier, we have developed game-changing technology that will allow us to stay comfortable without harming the environment. Our story starts at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, where in 20 2008, a group of scientists discovered a completely new way to create air conditioning using salt water. In 2012, this technology won the R&D 100 award, perhaps the most prestigious in the engineering profession. Since then, Blue Frontier has worked with this scientist to transform this game-changing technology into mass-producible, disruptive products. The Blue Frontier air conditioner reduces energy consumption by up to 90%. It is three times more efficient than the most efficient air conditioners in the market today, and it completely eliminates peak electricity demand. Our system also stores energy like an air conditioning battery allowing us to tie our unit's electricity consumption to periods when renewable energy is plentiful. The result is that we slash electric bills and fundamentally reduce the investments required to transform the electric grid towards renewable energy. The value of these savings is many times the capital cost of our unit, allowing innovative business models such as HVAC as a service. We are on the verge of completing and bringing to market our first product, a direct replacement of the most sold air conditioner in commercial buildings today. We are raising $10 million in a Series A equity round. This comes in the heels of a 1.8 million seed financing round and is leveraged by $5 million in grants and prices that the company has already won. Thank you. We're about to be halfway through our 16 list winners and we're halfway through the silver category. You may be wondering how to get in touch with these amazing founders. In addition to checking them out on the event site, we will be emailing all registered event attendees a PDF version of our event program that includes founders contact information. Keep an eye out for that to arrive in your inbox over the next few days. Next in silver, we have another mass challenge accelerator company based out of Brooklyn, New York, that is meeting the demands of the future of work. Congratulations to Event Cadence. Welcome to Cadence. We are a SaaS experience platform for companies to engage with their employees, customers, and community across time primarily focusing on the events they might have across the year. The importance for these organizations is to be able to have that continuous engagement. When it comes to specific events, there's typically the strategy, the information, the brand awareness, the product lines, the services that they need to convey internally and externally, which can have a huge cost. So the return on investment is imperative to justify those costs. This was always the number one marketing spend for an organization, but even more important now due to the global pandemic, 
with allied market research forecasting that in 2026, the event industry will be a $1.6 trillion industry, which does not even account for employee engagement, core communications, learning and development, and employee experience. We are celebrating our five-year anniversary coming up. So our platform is quite feature rich across desktop web, native iPhone, iPad, Android, with 20 plus features that have all come from our customers' insights, ideas based upon all of their use cases, which has led to all of this one, this wonderful platform. We have 2000 plus customers, 200 uh, plus, which are paid customers across different industries, market segments, use cases, that are listed here within our deck as well. We include two testimonials that I think really speak to our valid differentiation. We have that differentiation slide too, comparing against Hop and Attendify and Visibo. Our main ones being it is a 365 day a year platform for continuous engagement. It is a modern, beautiful interface that is fully brandable with a personalized recommendation engine guiding the audience members to what matters most to them with end to end customer success. Our deal size and business model, premium licensing, so that's single event licensing or multi-event licensing with discounts, or our primary model being the annual enterprise licensing, unlimited use per user per year, and then service-based mo modeling as well too, with the average revenue per account to date. Our growth strategy is focused on enterprise sales for health sciences, pharma, retail, finance, tech, Channel partnerships where we want 30 plus of our percent of our revenue to come through channel partnerships, along with referrals and affiliate marketing. We have been profitable year over year since we launched in 2017, uh, almost 100 percent revenue growth each year with 7.5 for 2021 net revenue percentage of 125 percent with great LTV from our biggest customers. We li link to some of our milestones along with our financial ask being able to take this 21 month runway to really hit these key outcomes uh, that are necessary for our next growth stage. Thank you so much for your inclusion. Company five out of the six silver category companies is Atlanta based with a female underrepresented founder who has recently brought her company through the Target Accelerator. Congratulations to team Pillow Sheets. Galloway, Chief Executive Dreamer and Inventor of The Pillow Sheet. Hi, I'm Marissa Hunt, Pillow Sheet's Dream Operations Officer. And we are located in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's exactly where I played the ultimate matchmaker at a school that I co-founded. I took the pillow and sheet, joined them together to create the most perfect dream union. Together, who would object to this power couple? They have managed to crack the sleep code with two utility patents and trademarks that range from here to China. We have revolutionized the bedding industry. Pillow Sheets is a leading manufacturer of the only bed sheet in the world that eliminates loose bedding and transforms any mattress into the ultimate sleep haven. That's right. Pillow Sheets has managed to crack the sleep code. From daily living and luxury to baby and children, hotel, resort, and spa, to our FDA-approved medical sheet, Pillow Sheet has redefined sleeping like a baby for all ages. Imagine being pandemic proof. During a time when everyone is looking for comfort, Pillow Sheets was able to apply our patents to multiple applications, opening up a huge opportunity in home health care and hospitals being an approved therapeutic medical device. She sounds like she's dreaming, but we have been able to figure out how to make this thing a reality, and that's through strategic partnerships. Think about it. We have CPG Sales Group, one of the best sales groups in the country. In addition to that, have you heard of Cisco Corporation? We are in final negotiations of having Cisco Corporation handle the whole supply chain from beginning to end with international distribution. Can we talk about international distribution? We have already secured a, a deal with Tmall with 32,000 units guaranteed within the next 24 months. These girls are on fire. From QVC, HSN, the big fine golden ticket, our revenue model, this is how we're gonna do it. We're asking for $5 million to get to $10 million within 24 months. This is how it works. We have direct to consumer, 
QVC, HSN, Amazon. Then we have business and business, retail sales. Listen, we have 15 SKUs that launched in Target on the 4th of July. I am telling you, this is an opportunity that you do not want to sleep on. From margins from 55 to 85 percent, we want to tell you so much more. Licensing deals. Imagine your child being able to go to sleep with their favorite character or their fairy tale story, maybe even yours. This is our licensing deal that we are in negotiations for. I have an NDA, can't tell it all. But if you come on board, I want you to put pillow sheets to the test and put sleepless nights to rest for everyone. Once again, crowd favorite voting among all 16 most fundable companies will be available later today through November 1st at the URL on the screen. Be sure to vote for your favorites and explore all 70 companies featured as list winners, finalists, and semifinalists. Closing out the silver category, we have a company with an underrepresented founder who has competed for two years in the Most Fundable Companies program. Most noteworthy, they have been awarded two SBIR Phase Two grants from the NCI NIH, totaling $3.9 million. Congratulations to Team Veriskin. Hello. My name is Miriana Sakisfilis. I'm a CEO of Veriskin, a San Diego-based medical device company dedicated to facilitating and improving the accuracy of skin cancer diagnostics. Skin cancer is the most common cancer in the US with over 5 million cases annually. Unfortunately, skin cancers are very difficult to distinguish from benign lesions, which leads to two problems. Thousands of lives lost and millions of unnecessary referrals and biopsies, resulting in $3.2 billion of avoidable cost. The total addressable clinical markets for Veriskin products in the US and the EU are estimated at $2.4 and $5.3 billion, respectively. It has been established that early skin cancer detection can save lives and reduce cost. Veriskin's non-imaging-based technology and AI algorithm work by using active perturbative hemodynamic measurement to detect structural and functional vascular abnormalities associated with cancer-induced pathological angiogenesis, which is a well-established early hallmark of cancer. Our pilot clinical studies on 125-plus biopsy-verified lesions have demonstrated 100% sensitivity and 94% specificity. Clinical adoption of the true score would greatly improve diagnostic performance of non-expert clinicians. Inherently higher diagnostic information content of the true score's hemodynamic test as compared to competitors' imaging-based technologies offers superior accuracy at lower cost if with no skilled user requirement. Our product is TrueScore, a non-invasive, handheld, low-cost patented device for non-expert clinicians and dermatologists that rapidly determines if a suspect lesion is malignant. Clinical adoption of the TrueScore device will benefit all stakeholders, patients, providers, and payers through improved patient outcomes and reduced cost. Veriskin's business strategy is based on a virtual razor blade model. They will focus on distribution to primary care providers and dermatologists through a sale of a device and a software-enforced per-use fee. Veriskin has finished technical development of the production device and set up a certified manufacturing line. Veriskin's IP portfolio includes issued patents and pending applications. The company has been supported by non-diluting grant awards from the NIH, totaling at $3.9 million. FDA has granted TrueScore the breakthrough device designation status in 2020. Next steps in the commercialization efforts include a final pre-pivotal algorithm training study in 2021, followed by the FDA pivotal trial in 2022. Veriskin has been founded by three experienced scientists and serial entrepreneurs with successful track records and multiple exits. The company is seeking to fill out the first tranche of the $2.5 million seed round to support FDA CE regulatory clearance. We have raised just over $1 million so far. Company is looking for additional co-investors. As it is typical for companies pursuing PMA regulatory pathway, Veriskin plans to exit via pre-market sale to a larger strategic player in 2023. To conclude, the adoption of the true scope by primary care providers and dermatologists will improve patient outcomes and reduce costs. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. I am Vince Mondepart. It is a pleasure to be here with you to celebrate the 2021 Most Fundable Company list winners. Today, I humbly represent Guratsadio as an alumnus, board member, and as a co-chair of the board's Entrepreneurship and Family Business Committee. The growth and success of the Most Fundable Companies program since 2018, when launched, has been fantastic. The program serves as a great complement 
to the many entrepreneurship initiatives that we have across the Grazia Business School. For example, I am happy to announce that our full-time MBA program was recently ranked number 51 in the nation by Bloomberg Business Week. We're proud of this position for our school and the confirmation that we are delivering on a mission of developing best for the world leaders. Even better though, our full-time entrepreneurship program placed number seven. What's special about this top 10 ranking for our entrepreneurship program is that it's based on surveys completed by graduating students, relatively recent alumni, and employers, not the schools themselves. And I believe our number seven spot is a direct result of the concerted effort of the Grazia Board. We have fully integrated ourselves into the entrepreneurship curriculum. We go beyond just being guest speakers in the classroom. We serve as individual mentors. In the words of one student, they highly rated their experience because they had direct one-on-one -on -one access with all the professors for startup advice, mentoring, and hands-on quant practice. Through collaboration across the Grazia community, entrepreneurship is embedded every day in our classrooms and in annual signature events like the Most Fundable Companies Showcase. It is now time to turn back to our list winners. So far today, we have met 10 fantastic companies in our bronze and silver categories. We are now moving on to the gold category with three companies total. Starting us off in alphabetic order by company name, our first company in the gold category is a healthcare technology company. They are based out of Florida and they have a female unrepresented founder. Plus, it gives me great pride to share that their CSO is one of our very own Pepperdine Grazio alumnus. Congratulations to new research and development. Do you realize that no one has thought to do anything about the common bedpan in almost 200 years? This medical device causes so much pain and suffering all over the world. 30% of all patient admissions end up on bedpans. 33% of all hospital-acquired pressure injuries occur in the buttocks and sacral area, and bedpans are to blame. Comfort, patient privacy, and cross-contamination are also a huge problem. Sadly, nothing has been done to improve the bedpan. Until now. My name is Michelle Marshall, and I am the founder and CEO of New Research and Development and also the inventor of WePan. WePan is a smart, connected bedpan that is ergonomically designed to reduce pressure injuries. It has an alert system that notifies caregivers when it's in use, it collects medical grade data like blood in the stools and blood in the urine. It has a biodegradable bag that reduces cross-contamination. For almost three years, my team has been intensely focused on executing plans to bring WePan to market. We have built several prototypes and a proof of concept with MIT and Harvard. We hold two utility patents and are pending on several others globally. WePAN has garnered interest from hospitals like Cancer Treatment Centers of America and the University of Miami Health Systems. We were invited to submit a full proposal to the NSF and are awaiting those results. Several strong investors have come on board and I have personally invested over $250,000 of my own money. My team and board of directors are very experienced and committed to going all the way. I'd like now to share with you my next goal. We are seeking $1 million to get to our next milestone. We are pre-revenue and the million dollars will help us with MVP development, FDA registrations, limited manufacturing for testing, clinical studies and product iterations. What's in it for you, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you a 10x return on investment in five years. If you would like to know more, please contact me at newresearch at gmail.com. Thank you. Hold on, everyone. Things are really starting to get interesting. Second, in the gold category, we have a company with a female co-founder where the CEO and COO have had six exits between them. They are a spin out from Temple University and are also members of the 2020 NYU Stern Endless Frontier and 2021 Summer Y Combinator cohorts. We bring you SFA Therapeutics.
Hi, I'm Ira Spector, the CEO and co-founder of SFA Therapeutics. Psoriasis is an incurable chronic skin disease that affects 3.5% of the world's population and is growing at greater than 11% per year. 75% of these patients feel unattractive. Over half get depressed. Many have financial distress and some are restricted to working from home because of embarrassment from this condition. Despite the drugs that you see on television every night, for most patients, those drugs are worse than the disease and only 10% of patients take them. Until now, we have a better solution. The current gold standard is immunosuppression, which leaves the patient open to severe side effects like TB and cancer. Our drug targets the root cause of the disease with an oral pill, not an injection or infusion that leaves patients feeling sick. And we have strong clinical data showing significant durable responses in every subject as shown on these slides. So our drug has significantly better safety and lower cost backed by seven patents. And we have a phase 1B clinical trial underway with a clear regulatory path from the FDA. Our goal is to expand the market to the 80% of patients who are currently untreated. This is a proven team with six prior exits. I have worked on 34 approved drugs. Mark Feidelson and Ala Arzumanian are world-class and they are my co-founders. King Lee and Jim Kerwin are also tops in their fields. This is a team of experienced drug developers who has spent five years of R&D developing this drug with an improved investigational new drug application. And I have personally invested a quarter of a million dollars in this program. Our investors include Ben Franklin, Temple, Excella, and Wilson Sonsini. We're raising $2 million in a bridge round using safes at a $20 million pre-money valuation led by a CEQA Capital and we're planning a Series A raise next year. This is an opportunity to invest just prior to a major inflection point. Our use of funds is to fund a Phase 2A clinical trial to validate the efficacy of this drug, and we expect this to lead to a licensing deal in two to four years. Comparable valuations for these types of drugs range from $200 to $500 million per asset, we have six assets in our pipeline for a potential valuation in excess of two and a half billion dollars. But most importantly, our vision is to change medicine. Please join us in this important journey. Thank you. Are you ready? This is getting really good. Concluding the gold category, we bring you this team of serial founders, a UBS project entrepreneur whose company was number 79 on the 2021 Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing privately owned businesses in America, and most recently received the Austin Chamber of Commerce A-List Award. They have competed in the Most Fundable Companies program for two years in a row. Congratulations to SipSpy. Hi, we're SipSpy from Austin, Texas, a direct-to-consumer subscription and e-commerce marketplace that makes discovering great tea fun, personalized, and affordable via Steep, our proprietary end-to-end -end fulfillment platform, which is powered by deep learning algorithms. My name is Stacey Brinkman, founder and CEO of SipSpy, and Ivan Lo is my co-founder and CTO. I'm the tea-obsessed one who intimately understands our why, and he's the technical mind behind our how. Over the last four years, we've made tea friends with hundreds of thousands of members, the vast majority who are Gen Z and millennial. Our personalization technology enables truly unique experiences. We create each with tremendous care for our members, AKA our tea fam. Members love SipSpy because we remove the paradox of choice, we bridge knowledge gaps, and we help them find their own unique path to tea. We truly love doing this. Tea isn't just tea when a member is experiencing it through SipSpy. For hundreds of tea brands, we make connecting with customers easy, efficient, and meaningful. A little internal secret, 
We also run a dozen of our own private label products lines. We're in our fifth year of business and on track to bring in 11 million in top line revenue this year. We'll grow our TFAM to just under 800,000 members with 65,000 of those members as subscribers. There's considerable room for growth via both product and product channel mix that our business and team has not yet touched due to constrained resources. Raising will enable us to serve the right products and services to the right people in the right channels, thereby further increasing our already fantastic CLTV to CAC ratio. To date, we've brought in $3.4 million in convertible notes and $300,000 from a strategic supplier via a five-year zero interest loan. We're halfway through our $3 million bridge round and we'll close this within the month. We're also having conversations for a $10 million A round, which will close no later than Q1 next year and likely by end of year this year. Of the $10 million A round, 34% is going toward team building, 30% is going toward operations and product, and 26% is going toward growth marketing. Our A round will enable us to grow more rapidly and achieve greater profitability, after which we'll have enough internally generating, generated cash to drive the business for the foreseeable future. We'd love for you to contact us to close out our bridge if you're able to write checks of $100,000 or more, or if you're interested to lead our A round. To learn more, please visit the Pepperdine event website or sipspy.com. Thank you so much for this opportunity and I hope to talk to you soon. Hello, my name is Jim Kasperi, and I'm the CEO and founder of the Venture Alliance, the company who donated all the IP and the TVA trademark we use in this competition. After over 20 years of developing what we have lovingly called the FICO scoring system for entrepreneurs, it was a distinct pleasure of my partner, Elliot Reef and myself to donate in 2017 to Pepperdine also my alma mater, our secret sauce to the most fundable companies. So why do entrepreneurs and investors need such a process? For those who remember the dot-com era, there was a time when angels and venture capitalists were literally throwing money at any entrepreneur that could fog a mirror because everyone was afraid they'd miss out on the next big opportunity. When the bubble finally burst, a lot of money was lost. We saw this as an opportunity to create a logical, organized process of due diligence that would filter out the hype and focus on just good, sound principles that define a successful entrepreneur. We've been doing it now for over 20 years, and guess what? It works. But it doesn't just highlight the best companies. It has some exciting unintended consequences that benefit all entrepreneurs who go through this process. First, it teaches entrepreneurs what to expect when pitching professional investors. Our questionnaire teaches them what types of questions to expect. After each stage, every entrepreneur gets a detailed SWOT analysis showing where they did well and where they need to improve. Our feedback is what makes this competition special. Investors never tell an entrepreneur why they don't invest. So the entrepreneur keeps making the same mistake over and over. One of the most important goals of this competition is to break that paradigm and actually help entrepreneurs fix what can be fixed. Second, it levels the playing field. By using an automated scoring system on our first screening, matters of race, ethnicity, social status, geography, etc., are ignored and the entrepreneur is scored purely on the principles that constitute a solid entrepreneurial company. Third, it provides unparalleled recognition. Because this process is now part of the Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies competition, the word is out. This is the toughest competition any entrepreneur can enter, anywhere. Winning here actually means something. On our fourth year of running this competition, and much further into the pandemic than anyone imagined, we had every reason to expect that the quality of the entrepreneurs could have been less than what we had seen in the past. Well, so far you've seen 
13 great companies present today who have absolutely proven that that is not so, and the best is yet to come. But before we announce our final category of the day, I would like to personally thank the Singleton and Grazio Dio Foundations for joining us in this important work of delivering entrepreneurial education to thousands of companies. And now, it's time to bring you our top three platinum category companies. This first company has participated in plug and play Boomtown Accelerators. They have multiple accolades, such as a phase one win at the Department of Energy's e-robot competition. And they prove that persistence pays off. Competing for multiple years now in our competition and landing at the platinum level in 2021. I am proud to introduce to you Flex Solutions. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Bilski, an inventor turned contractor turned mechanical engineering professor. I founded Flex Solutions out of my own frustrations on the work site. Our team has spoken to hundreds of stakeholders across the construction and maintenance landscape in their own way they all describe the exact same problem. They can't get where they need to work and safely do what they need to do, something I've experienced firsthand as a contractor and licensed professional engineer. A key takeaway is that on the road to full autonomy, there are a number of construction and maintenance tasks that can be greatly improved by an affordable and user-friendly Cobotic smart tool for getting into difficult places without the need for ladders or entering confined spaces. Our solution is the FlexBot. The FlexBot is a modular, snake-like robot one inch in diameter. It's designed to fit into tight spaces to inspect, map, and autonomously perform the required maintenance. Every FlexBot link is identical and packed full of sensors, including cameras and flashlights. Combining multiple links with our patented extension and rotation mechanisms is what makes a FlexBot. Different end effectors can be easily interchanged, like a spray nozzle, gripper, specialty camera, and even a drill. Here are some use cases that we learned from our corporate partners. After buying an existing building, it's necessary to map and inspect the structure to plan improvements and identify deficiencies. A FlexBot can be used in all the nooks and crannies to map and visually inspect. The FlexBot can even allow for next generation retrofits like aerosol sealing and occupied structures, and even fish wires after the drywall is up. Uses for the FlexBot extend beyond the walls of a structure to the utility infrastructure connecting us. Workers can remain safely on the ground while still operating the FlexBot. Future applications include aircraft inspection and enabling bridge construction companies to test new technologies like tub girders. The FlexBot costs less than a tenth of our competition while being smaller and more agile. We're playing in some multi-trillion dollar markets like building construction, utilities, and infrastructure management. The serviceable portion for inspection and maintenance alone is more than $60 billion a year and growing fast. We partnered with Gensler, the world's largest architecture firm, and Skyline Capital Builders to form Team FGS, phase one winners in the Department of Energy's $200,000 e-robot prize for minimally invasive building envelope retrofit technologies. Our roadmap is to evolve from pure hardware sales to robots as a service as our autonomous capabilities expand towards large-scale data collection from mass deployed flexbots. We plan to monetize our data in these three ways, exponentially increasing the company's value as our data sets grow. Our team has worked at leading organizations before joining Flex and are deeply passionate about solving real-world problems with mass deployable robotic solutions. We've raised $500,000 in convertible notes and are preparing our go-to-market seed round for the beginning of 2022. We have several big partnerships and announcements coming later this year. To learn more, please check out our website and subscribe to our socials. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Guy Baker, and I'm a member of the Most Fundable Companies Advisory Council and a platinum sponsor for today's program. I'd like to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about my firm, the Wealth Teams Alliance, and why I support entrepreneurship at Pepperdine. Every entrepreneur faces similar problems, how to manage their personal life while they dedicate hours to building a successful enterprise. The Wealth Teams Alliance provides financial coaching to these business owners who are just too busy being successful. And we do this by reducing taxes, increasing return, and helping them build an integrated wealth plan. 
I support the most fundable companies program here at Pepperdine because I believe in capitalism. Entrepreneurship is the lifeblood of capitalism, and without it, America would never have been world leaders in technology, medicine, or any of the other thousands of ways business has made life better here in this world. I believe the inventive and creative business minds who start a company from a small kernel and grow it into amazing enterprises that support hundreds, maybe even thousands of homes, need the support of the academic and business community. Being a platinum sponsor is my small way of contributing to this incredible mission. It's now my pleasure to announce to you the second company in today's platinum category. They're second alphabetically only because of the order of the company name. So we bring to you a healthcare products company led by a multi-time founder who earlier in 2021 was a tech star Boulder startup founder, and was featured on the Forbes Next 1000 list. Congratulations to Team Gales. A nurse passes away from infection every 30 minutes. And the number one issue in infection control? Shoes. Clogs lack long-term comfort and support, and mesh athletic shoes lack protection from infectious fluids and diseases like hepatitis and HIV frequently spilled on shoes in the OR and ICU. So we founded Gales, smart PPE footwear for healthcare. I'm founder and CEO Rob Gregg with a former exit in footwear and a performance marketing background having driven $5 billion in direct consumer sales for companies like Casper, Warby Parker, and Procter & Gamble. And leveraging my footwear expertise with design input from 89 medical facilities, we created the first and only antimicrobial, easy to clean, protective shoes that received a 95% nurse approval rating. So how big is this? In 2014, a startup called Figs took a direct-to-consumer approach to scrubs and is now targeting a $4 billion IPO. But scrubs are just part of the biosafe uniform. And the biggest piece still left unprotected are shoes. And shoes are a big market. In fact, six times larger than scrubs. So with no one addressing this critical area, Gale stepped up. In combining our knowledge and expertise, we built a supply chain with 89% gross margins. We're a footwear company with greater margins than SaaS. And since starting Techstars, we closed a half million dollar round, began production shipping this July, and built direct sales channel partnerships to reach over 150,000 nurses per day. And by the way, Gale's extends beyond healthcare. With our direct-to-consumer playbook and former executives from Crocs, we're bringing Gales to a global scale. Natural market extensions include in-home caregivers, seniors, dentists, bartenders, waiters, chefs, and any area where comfort and safety are a concern. Scrub startups broke a billion dollar valuation in seven years, Allbirds did it in four, and with the right partners, we're looking to get there faster and save lives doing so with Gales. Third in our platinum category, again, the order within categories is not a ranking, but only alphabetical by company name. We have a very exciting company based in Arizona, announcing the final company of the day. A huge congratulations to PB Analytics, DBA, Rixon Technology. Hi, I'm Dave Johnson. I'm the CEO of Rixon Technology. Together with my co-founder and our CTO, Justin Hatcher, we would like to thank Pepperdine University for this opportunity. Rixon offers a unique data protection platform designed to minimize IT security and compliance cost and put control back into the hands of our clients and data owners. We are a post-revenue company with ARR in the six figures, and we currently operate at a profit. We have three technology patents granted and a fourth pending. Today, IT security resembles a castle and moat strategy that was used centuries ago. Organizations attempt to secure data through bigger and thicker technology walls, using age-old methods like encryption that leaves sensitive data ripe for compromise. These solutions are costly, risky, create compliance headaches for technology and business executives worldwide. This antiquated reactive approach does not work. Organizations are spending $183 billion annually, while cybercrime costs are still expected to reach $10 trillion by 2025. Rixon's patented solution solves these problems. 
Our solution allows organizations to make data theft and breaches a non-issue, while dramatically reducing the cost of security and regulatory compliance. Also, we natively address the data owner's rights requirements, including the right to be forgotten. Rixon is not encryption. There are no keys to be stolen. We do not use token vaults. We never store or even have access to a company's data. Although the core of our technology is a cloud-based vaultless tokenization solution, we take a totally different approach to what's been used in the past to secure data. With Rixon, if a company's defenses fail and the data is stolen, it is completely unusable. Our solution is transparent. Organizations can operate the way they always have, but without the cost and the risk associated with data exposure. Our SaaS solution is available globally. Cloud native, extremely fast, hyperscalable, multilingual, and format preserving. And our solution is very simple to implement into a company's existing technology infrastructure. Rixon is a horizontal SaaS company. With our global footprint, we can operate in any industry vertical, in any language, in any country. We have clients in major market verticals, including healthcare, fintech, travel, payment processing, and more. Our patented cloud native technology allows us to operate with very high gross margins and capitalize on global distribution channels. We currently have distributed partners in the US, EU, and Asia Pacific, and we are positioned to scale quickly. We are seeking to raise $4 million to invest in scaling sales and distribution efforts in the US and key global markets to further cement our product market fit and to continue to expand our IT portfolio. Thanks for your time. For more information, please contact me at dave at rixontechnology.com. And there we have them, the 2021 Pepperdine Most Fundable Companies. Congratulations to all the startups. I invite everyone to visit the event site to learn more about these incredible companies. Don't forget to vote for your favorites by November 1st, and most importantly, fuel these great startups by investing. On behalf of the entire Most Fundable Companies team here at Pepperdine Grazie Dio Business School, thank you for joining us, and yes, we look forward to seeing you in person next year. Do you want to grow your career and have a bigger impact on the world? The Pepperdine Grazia Dio Business Schools programs are designed to develop you as a purpose-driven leader. With full and part-time offerings in flexible formats and with specialized concentrations, you have the ability to customize your educational pathway to fit your unique needs. Whether you're just starting out, at a C-suite level, or somewhere in between, we have a program to transform your career and help you achieve your personal goals. To help you get there, we have many scholarship and financial aid opportunities available. Make the most of who you are, for yourself and for the world. Learn more about our programs and scholarship opportunities today 